we're here today to talk about the T1 Trust, which is an effort to build a brand new steam locomotive pattern largely after the original Pennsylvania Railroad designs from the 1940s. FMW Solutions is one of several strategic partners working to will this fascinating machine into existence. Joining us in this conversation is Jason Johnson, who is the project manager of the T1 Trust, Davidson Ward, president of FMW Solutions, Wolf Fengler, Vice President of Engineering at FMW Solutions, and Matt Palermo, one of FMW's staff engineers who has been steadily working on engineering the frame for the T1. Now, 10 years ago, this would have been considered a total pipe dream of a project, but now the T1 Trust has 41% of this new build steam locomotive already completed, which is pretty incredible. So Jason, how did the T1 Trust get this far? And Davidson, how did FMW come into the mix? Really, after the A1, say so the guys in Europe did, and they said, hey, if the guys in Europe can do it, we can duplicate what they're doing and their success and do it here in the United States and bring back what is arguably the fastest, most technologically advanced steam locomotive of the time. And, uh, you know, we wanted a, wanted a nice challenge. And so we uh, put a plan in place and step by step, we're uh, completing that plan. So we're actually ahead of schedule where we expected to be and with a completion date of 2030. But uh, we uh, acquired a tender. We have the boiler well on its way to completion. Um, hundreds of other parts created. And uh, uh, we all have known that the frame was going to be the biggest single challenge that we had uh, going into this project. And I uh, uh, spent the last year working with uh, you fine folks to uh, overcome the engineering challenges we had from a single piece casting in the 40s to uh, a fabricated design that we've come up with today. So uh, that, that's pretty much how we got here and uh, uh, tried to uh, partner with people that uh, are uh, understand what we're doing and how we got here. We founded FMW in April of 2016 and the T1 Trust was probably our first engineering client. Uh, I know Wolf had been volunteering with the T1 Trust for number of years before then, um, we got the SolidWorks software working with you guys to start, I believe, boiler engineering tasking. So as we've grown, been able to grow with the T1 Trust and obviously taking on the, the framework here is something that's really um, a, a point of pride for us as we try to take on challenging projects, things that are um, really cutting edge insofar as taking what was once a cast component and making a weldment out of it. One of the challenges that we have with you know, restoring existing equipment is you're, you're inheriting um, unknown material conditions. Um, you're inheriting 60, 70, 80 plus years of wear and tear on the equipment and, and on the metals that are involved. So that's a lot of fatigue that you have to deal with. Um, having, having the opportunity to create something from scratch means that we know just like the boiler, we know exactly what materials are going in to start with. Um, we can define, you know, procedures around welding, and uh, and look at all the stresses involved. Not just from, you know, trying to duplicate what was there, but um, leveraging all the learning over the last number of decades. That the the type of thing that we would apply to a brand new locomotive design. Regardless, if it's steam or diesel or one of the other, you know, programs that we work on that are a little more high tech, um, you know, we, we take that knowledge, we take, you know, current standards and, and apply that to this particular project and, and make sure that that frame is is, is safe, uh, is, is well engineered and is going to last, um, you know, hopefully 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years, you know, as, as we would with a normal uh, frame project. From my point of view, one of the hardest parts of this task was really trying to read all the old prints and trying to get into their, um, the original designer's mindset of, okay, how are they referencing these dimensions from, how are they building this thing? Because, you know, what will happen is that they'll only give you a distance of, okay, well, this is 102 inches between this line and this line, but it's almost as if that would be sometimes existing in space with no reference to each other. So you have to figure out, okay, well, this line actually references from this line that's on the other side of the page and just kind of reverse engineer from that, especially with the task of trying to mimic the appearance of the original frame uh, with a fabrication instead of a casting. 
Jason, the T1 has been living rent-free in your head probably for most of your life. How does it feel to see bits and pieces of it come together first in rendering software and then slowly over time become physical pieces that you can ship around uh, to show off to people. Oh, it's incredible. Like I said, I, I started dreaming about this project in uh, 94, 95 timeframe and uh, told people back then uh, that uh, if I ever build a locomotive, I'd build a T1 and they continue to laugh at me and uh, here we are uh, well on our way. So it's, um, I, I look at it as a challenge and, and pretty much everything I do in life, uh, the bigger the better on it. Uh, I, I like a good challenge and and bringing it to life. So every time a new piece part gets made, whether something is uh, at this point simple as a box spoke driver, um, all the way up to the size of the boiler, the cab, even the uh, the tender in itself, when I see each of individual parts, I imagine them all together. It can, I can visualize what it's going to look like when it's completed. Uh, so each step we get along the way, the frame being, in my mind, kind of the linchpin and all this, bringing it all together and um, really going to, to put us over the edge. I mean, we, we feel like we've made it to the uh, the summit of the project that, that at this stage of the game, majority of people at the beginning didn't believe we were going to do it. And as we do another part, um, that kind of went away slowly, but surely there's still some people that still think we're crazy, but they'll still donate to us now, uh, knowing that there's still a chance, but, uh, the, the, the money still continues to come in. Um, and we have to be as a trust, be very good stewards of those donations that uh, we're taking from people and turning them into steel that you know, were 100% volunteer. There's no way that's paid. We're all doing this out of love uh, of the project and doing something bigger than ourselves to make this happen. So uh, it's an exciting project. Um, at this point, hundreds, if not thousands of people have, have, have at the very least opened their wallets, but others have donated engineering time. Uh, I mean, thousands and thousands of hours to us. I mean, we've raised several million dollars to this point. We have a lot to show for it. The frame is the next big piece of this. Once we have the frame completed and early completed, uh, um, we can start to bring all the parts together in one location and have a uh, open house and that'll really show off uh, where we are. And at that point, we feel we'll be at the point of mass acceptance and uh, hopefully funding We'll step up at that stage and uh, get us over the because even once you get 80 percent complete and our completion rate is based on weight uh there's still a lot of work to do with plumbing and and uh sheet metal work and uh, there's so many items left to do even at that pay, the point that um in some respects time spent on it you're only 50 percent time spent so we understand that so um, donors are going to have to step up uh, or some source of funding is going to have to step up as we get further along on the project to keep the momentum going that we currently have because things are going to become more expensive and uh, uh, as we go. So, uh, so far, our donors have stepped up and done that. Our supporters have stepped up and, and kept us going whenever we needed it and asked for it. So uh, you know, that's the, the point of kicking off this frame and, and uh, we're we spent the last year working with you guys, going through the engineering very painstakingly. I, I can't uh, give a shout out enough to Wolf and Matt for the work that they have done on this. And then also Jack Tool for doing the modeling prior to this, taking the original model to give us a baseline. Um, they spent thousands of hours uh, creating that as well. So uh, it's been a team effort, everybody coming together. I just get to be the guy to help orchestrate all the pieces, parts, and bring everything in place. Um, you know, that's, I'm a, my honor to do that and uh i look forward to seeing this thing completed and and uh run down the rails uh someday not too distant future from the beginning the naysayers seem to glom on to the fact that it's very difficult to cast a frame this big um jason maybe you'd agree but that seemed to be one of the big stumbling blocks of oh geez how can you cast something this big and maybe the people that do the caterpillar um, dump truck frames can do it and it a lot of it is trying to adapt advances and technologies that have come so much further from 1940 to today, such as weldments, right? I know Matt and Wolf spent a lot of time trying to convert and engineering the conversion from a cast frame to something that's welded, that's um, stronger and maybe more flexible where it needs to be and more rigid where it needs to be. 
Um, and as I think about just the T1 project in general, it's, it's not simple enough just to build a new steam locomotive, like something that has one set of cylinders. This has two set of cylinders. It's going to have pocket valves. It's a very long um, fabrication. And so it's, it's a pretty big lift. And what we have today that the designers of the 1930s and 40s didn't have, obviously, is three-dimensional CAD software. The ability not just to design the, the frame in three dimensions, but also do finite element analysis and stress analyses to figure out where are the weak areas. And this is an iter iterative process that I know Matt and Wolf worked on diligently for months. So hopefully they can, maybe Matt, can you, can you opine a bit about the FEA analysis and sort of every iteration you went through on that? In total, I think I, I went through 11 versions of the frame model and Wolf, I think that's up now to 16 <laughs> with some of your edits, right? So yeah, something like that. Um, basically every time, uh, every version that I would create would basically be, okay, well, this component actually isn't going to work or isn't going to design right or work properly and integrate into the frame as I needed to, or this whole section of the frame needs to be completely redesigned in order to get the stresses to flow properly. Um, the big FEA test was the 1 million pound buff load, where um, the, per the FRA uh, guidelines, in order to design a locomotive frame properly, it has to survive a 800,000 pound buff load basically coming in from the buffer beam, which we applied on at the buffer beam at the uh, rear end underneath the cab where it will connect with the tender. And we just added an extra 200,000 pounds on top of that because we want this frame to survive 100 years plus all the wear and tear that will arise from running at 140 miles an hour with four cylinders, not just two. <laughs> Um, so just kind of iterating that, making sure it was going to survive all the stress that were going to flow properly uh, throughout the entire frame and not just get concentrated into one little corner that will eventually grow into a complete frame failure. And then eventually, at once I had worked uh, that out, then we had also uh, worked out, okay, now how is the frame going to twist with all the cylinders working at different rates and at different positions? Is it going to... Uh, flex properly or as as lo as low or as little as we want uh, when we're lifting it, that was actually a big uh, challenge as well because we also had to factor in the boiler and its rigidity into the frame. There's a lot of armchair critics that are very dismissive of an effort like this. But I think for someone like you, Wolf, like you're working on diesel locomotive technologies, passenger car technologies, engineering alternative fuel research and locomotives. In terms of all the projects that we're working on from an engineering perspective, the T1 really isn't that special or unique, but trained people tend to only see the locomotive and only view it very uh, narrowly. Would you agree? I do agree. Some of the, the things that Matt alluded to in the FEA analysis included bringing some of the formulas that were developed in the steam area era to deal with, you know, the, the yawing that comes from, you know, the reciprocating drivetrain, right? That's something that isn't done today, but we had to bring those calculations back that were done in the 40s and whatnot. And to get those torques that Matt was talking about, at the same time, you know, we have to look at, at um, you know, those typical buff load cases and, and other things that are dealt with on the modern railroad environment. But we're fortunate in that because we do do some very unusual projects, um, we're capable of thinking outside of the normal box, right? You know, when, when we're working on, say, a hydrogen fuel tender for a locomotive, right? There are things that are involved in that kind of analysis that, that aren't typically done even in the locomotive world per se. And so being able to leverage that thinking and, and marry that with, with looking at this frame, um, which really incorporates a lot of things that, you know, are being done in the modern locomotive world in terms of how we engineered um, the, the frame, because we were not only trying to provide the functionality it needed, but keep cost in mind too. Um, keep, keep, 
um, fabrication costs, keep material costs in control, um, and, and hit those performance metrics for being able to, as Matt said, you know, last for 100 years and, and um, hold up to 140 mile an hour operation. And instead of planned obsolescence, it's planned preservation. This giant is one of a great fleet of newly developed multiple cylinder steam locomotives, which are now ready to haul tomorrow's brand new trains. Here is the power for the new era of rail transportation. Now that technology has caught up with uh, the builder's intentions, what are some other modifications that, that the T1 Trust is making to make this locomotive more efficient and more capable out on the railroad? Our goal was not to change the locomotive and make a, uh, they had a T1A, which had the Wall Street valve gear, but make a T1B or anything. We're not trying to change it that much. It's going to make that big a difference in it. Uh, we don't want anybody to say, well, you made this change. So it's not really a T1. That's not our intention. Uh, our goal is to keep it as original as possible so that our changes are more around um, stuff to make it operational on the current network, main net line network around the country. So stuff like that, so a fuel source. We're, we are going to burn oil rather than coal. Um, we thought that would be a bigger deal, but people understand the reason why uh, that's a needed uh, moving forward. So that's one of the big changes that we're going to make. Uh, we'll do some updating of the drafting in the front end because of oil burning, uh, adding overfire jets on it just to get some more combustion air in into the firebox, items like that. Those are minimal in the grand scheme of things. Those aren't drastic changes, uh, nothing to look. Uh, adding uh, stuff like PTC con uh, controls to the locomotive so they can't operate on the main line, we'll do that. But by the time our locomotive's done, uh, other main line locomotives will have uh, carved that path for us uh, on that. So we're kind of just sitting back waiting, letting other people be the guinea pigs on that to get that done for us. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so there are those changes on that. Uh, it, not, a, I mean, it, for the most part, otherwise, it's going to be very much original to the way it was, with the exception of some of the things um, to point out by Matt and Wolf uh, on the design changes of the fabrication of the frame. So overall, dimensionally, the frame is still the frame. It's not changed dimensionally. The weight is pretty much right there. It's flexibility or rigidity, however you want to look at it, is that it's still the same uh, or very close to the original. Um, we just had to come up with a way to actually manufacture it with modern times, modern equipment. So uh, guys have done a really nice job of that working with uh, contractors now to finalize all the pricing on that to uh, actually start fabrication this year with it and uh, move along pretty rapidly. So uh, we're, we're pretty excited to, to get going. And um, one thing of note that came out of this that we dearly didn't expect, the original scope of this was just to build the frame, design, engineer the frame and complete the frame. Well, out of that, um, Matt and Wolf had to go and engineer the spring rigging, had to engineer the brake rigging, um, add the trailing truck, all kinds of other extra stuff that we had not anticipated having to do on this to change the scope. But but now that all that work is now completed, so we're actually further ahead than we actually anticipated we we're going to be at this stage of the, the game. So. Um, and there's been change, minor changes here and there. We got to move this bracket here. We got to uh, modify this uh, along the way to make it one, so you can manufacture it, and two, just so that you can makes more sense now. Because if they were rebuilding this thing, if they were doing another order on, they would make these slight changes anyway. We like to view this from a perspective of of what would the designers do today if they had the tools available today that we do, right? I mean, you see EMDs making welded trucks now for some of their locomotives or progress rail, excuse me, um, even overseas. So the Germans at the Hartz Narrow Gauge Railway, they have a fleet of 17 locomotives that run on this really grueling grade. When they were built, they were all plate frame locomotives, which is sort of a British standard. And as they overhaul them, they're going to a, a more bar frame standard like the US. But there's examples elsewhere in preservation where there's an advance in technology that we can embrace that may not change the outward appearance of the locomotive, but like you said, Jason, makes it so, so that we can manufacture it or makes it so that it's more reliable longer term. And 
I mean, aside from just making sure there's a product that we can build, we view it from if the tools available and they would have done it. That's something that there's no, we don't lose sleep at night uh, proposing a welded frame, for instance. Well, a couple other aspects too. I mean, we're all steam guys, right? And so we've, we've worked on, we've run, we've maintained, you know, this equipment. And so we understand that aspect of it. Jason and I were talking about, you know, crawling up through the frame to, to pull, you know, belly plugs in the boiler for a washout, right? You know, we think about, since we've done it, we think about who's going to do it in the future. You know, we, th- we think about what are the federal re- regulations that this is coming under and making sure that, that those aspects are addressed um, as we go through the design process. So it's, there's, there's a lot more than, than you might think that goes into this. And, and Jason touched on it a little bit earlier in terms of um, that the frame is kind of the, the, the linchpin of the locomotive. If you think about it, the boiler bolts to it, you know, and the wheels and the and the the cannon boxes with the axles come up into the the pedestal jaws, right? Um, all these things we have to keep track of all these interactions um, because if if we screw that up, um, you know, that that can be a really costly fix. In the computer, it's cheap. You know, ones and zeros are cheap. Out on the shop floor, carving metal that's expensive. And so that's why we try to do as as much in the computer as we can. And that's why some of the things that Jason mentioned that came up during the process did, because we got into it and we said, we really need to look at this relationship between say the boiler and the cylinder saddle and make sure we've got that nailed down so that we don't have a problem later. So Jason, something that you and I talk about often when discussing the T1 is this idea that America doesn't build anything anymore. We've lost our industrial might. And in the post-war era, post-industrialization era, there is some degree of truth to that. But I think what's interesting about the T1 Trust is that you guys are a lot like a tech startup. You've got a slightly nutty, interesting idea that nobody else is really doing in the same manner or fashion, or maybe you were inspired by uh, something that's comparable, but you've been able to innovate for almost a decade now, and you're to this point where it's becoming a living, breathing object. Um, I would love to know uh, from all of you guys, like, what have you learned about the our capabilities as a as a country as an industrial powerhouse as a nation of railroaders what have you learned from the t1 trust design process so far for me it's just it's persistence there's somebody out there that that can do it you just have to be persistent to find that contractor and then when you explain what you're doing you find out that they're pretty crazy themselves and they actually embrace your project and will help you out and your craziness. It's kind of a, a, a community of uh, people that just aren't necessarily right in the head, but have a, uh, and they might not have anything to do, like, what, for example, trying to find a foundry to pour the, uh, the drivers for this locomotive was, I had 60 no's before I got a yes from foundries around the country. So it was just nonstop uh, getting, I just got another no, all right, go to the next one. And, and then keep going and then finally found the right one. Well, now these guys are doing work for a lot of other operations uh, in the country and they never did any steam locomotive work uh, prior to us going to them. And and uh, so now they're pouring driving boxes and, and all kinds of other uh, stuff for uh, steam operations all over the country now because of that uh, and sharing that within the community of the steam uh, network that we have here. The community is fairly small. So uh, some some respects, we all uh, run into each other at some point uh, in our lifetime and, and work together at some point. And uh, we take advantage and share that knowledge. And uh, that's one prime example of, you know, hey, we just kept getting no's, finally got a yes, and they've been a great uh, car, a vendor to work with and have the capability of pouring up to 5,000 pounds of any alloy I can throw at them. And, and uh, the more unique I throw it at them, they, they welcome the challenge. So they want something unique. And, and uh, so I keep throwing stuff at them and they keep delivering. And um, you know, we're- here's a New York Central Hudson. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be back in six months. <laughs> yeah. And listen, and understand, like I said, we talk about that all the time. If we would love 
to share what we've learned and the information we have with a group trying to build a New York Central Hudson or a Yellowstone or, or even an 060. I, it doesn't make any difference. We'll share the secret sauce. It's almost like the T1 Trust has become the Altoona test plant in a way. Like you guys are, are, are chasing down these interesting threads, these technological advances, these relationships, these light bulb moments, and now you're able to share them with other entities. Like I said, yeah, we we are gonna have to be one of the most transparent organizations out there. We share our funding, what, where we're spending every dollar on, how, how we're doing everything. Uh, again, that was very important in the early on in our success that basically we're asking you blindly to donate to us and that we're not gonna take that money and, and go have a, a party in Tahiti and talk about T1 last time. You know, we, when we go to conferences and stuff like that, we all pay on our own dime. We don't use any of the trust uh, funds to do anything, uh, uh, any of the fundraising stuff. It's, it's all private money of our own that we put into it to, to do those things. And that's, we want every dollar being donated to come in and go right to the project. Being a young guy, you know, nowadays, like a lot, a lot of people in my generation are very, oh, look at our grandparents or our great grandparents like the way they did things that was super crazy but you know it, it, anything from like you know lead paint or uh you know cooking on a coal stove to building and running steam locomotives you know they were pretty ingenious inventions and methods uh, for their time they got the job done of what needed to be done and um just it it seems as though, and this, as a history buff, which is also part of why I'm built trains, <laughs> um, uh, just a, as a history buff, it's almost as though the industrial history of the United States is, all right, here's the next new thing. All right, scrap whatever was before that. Here's the next new thing. All right, scrap the last new, brand new thing. And it's almost as if the preservation uh, community nowadays is actually – taking cues from the British guys saying, oh, you know, they have hundreds of steam locomotives running. Why do we only have two or three? And it seems that people are actually waking up and rediscovering the old methods, the old ingenuity, the old um, ways of doing things and understanding that they still have a place in uh, today's, uh, today's world, even if it's just, you know, running around the park and bringing joy to a couple of five-year-olds. Like, Steam locomotive still brings a smile to an old person's face. In as much as it's exciting to um, fill in a missing piece of the historical record by bringing this locomotive back to life, and, and really with, um, to, to Matt's point, the more you can experience that history viscerally, experience, you know, with all your senses, um, the more you start to connect it to the people that made that history. Um, and, and this locomotive fills a very interesting piece of that puzzle, and it's going to connect to people in ways that not a lot of other locomotives that are still around can do. Um, that's part of it. And then, um, as Jason was saying, the, the abilities that we've come up with to, um, to fabricate either using new or, or older techniques or some combination of the two um, is going to go well beyond just what we're doing with the T1. You know, as some of the, the older locomotives continue to be used, of course, um, things will break, right? And we want to keep those uh, pieces of equipment operating as well for exactly the same reasons that people can, can make those connections in history. Um, and so being able to leverage these things to keep that equipment running as well. Um, you know, we're kind of paving that way, I think, for the next hundred years of preservation um, to, to make sure that um, that equipment is available as well to tell the story. I'd say on a 30,000 foot view to echo what Jason had said about um, tenacity and sticking with it. I mean, we are in a small community of people that work on steam trains. There are sometimes projects that come out of left field and it's just another reminder that there's always a place at the table, even if the project from the start seems like something that's totally harebrained. You know, it's it's hard to say no to rugged determinism. That's what these American grand ideas are all about, right? This is the embodiment of that. Um, on the detailed level, 
um, going all the way back to 2016 and before. I know Wolf was working on with the team there at the T1 on the engineering for the Form 4 and some of the boiler engineering of a Bell Pair firebox. And having some of that familiarity came in handy as we got involved in the project in Altoona with the K4, right? So have familiarity with that. So there's direct things that we can point to that supporting the T1 Trust and working with them have benefited not just uh, their organization and FMW, but also uh, the Altoona group there as they look to get the 1361 back in operation. So Jason, we're really excited to be a part of this project, obviously. Uh, I think there are many people that are eager to see the T1 Trust to get past that 50% marker, and that's coming soon. It's happening, like you said, ahead of schedule. How can people learn more and keep supporting what you are doing? Our website is typically our best source of information, or we do a lot on Facebook. Uh, we find that uh, a lot of our supporters are on Facebook, so that's a great way to um, just reach out to them on a regular basis. So feel free to follow us there. Uh, and then we also have a mailing list that you can join on our website that uh, typically those donors find out information uh, prior to the general public on that. So we, we like to give, uh, especially our founding club members, uh, a little advanced knowledge of what's going on. So. That, uh, it just gives it a little, makes it a little special for them. We're not real big on telling you what we're going to do, only what we've already done. Uh, so uh, that that's a big uh, a big advantage that we have over a lot of organizations. We don't overpromise, underdeliver. We we try to go the other way with it. So we try to surprise people with uh, what we're doing and and uh, being ahead of it on that. So uh, I'll always be looking for. Uh, surprises from us. In the spirit of sharing, FMW is going to publish some of our work in the links with this video and on our website at fmwsolutions.com. Uh, we'll be sharing our progress right along with you, and uh, we look forward to, to getting this thing built. <laughs>